any ideas as to the ultimate source of the assassination attempt on the Pope? Uh, yes. Um, the, uh, as, you, as you know, um, the initial investigation in the 80s uh, uh, seemed to pointed to a Bulgarian um, uh, intelligence service operation that, that they had recruited what's his name, um, uh, Mac Mac Ali Akka, the Turk, <laughs> they recruited him, and then they had probably intended to kill him after the operation, after he killed the Pope. He didn't succeed in killing the Pope, and, and they fled the scene uh, before. That was what was suspected, and there were good reasons for it, since um, the, the assassin himself identified a man called Antonov, who was working in the Bulgarian airline service, but who was, uh, who was almost certainly a Bulgarian secret agent, as, 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 having, been, as having recruited him. He described accurately uh, uh, Antonov's flat, and so on and so forth. Uh, what, what, what Antonov was tried with a critic. He was a critic because it, he produced evidence that he was, in fact, not in the St. Peter's Square, as, as uh, the assassin said he was, but in his office. Um, the many investigations have continued since then, but since then um, there was an investigation by uh, the Part of Town Parliamentary Commission, um, and they, uh, with advanced computer techniques, they discovered that Antonov was indeed in the crowd. Um, so his alibi was fake, and it's very likely that, uh, that Mehmed Ali Akhtar was telling the truth. Now, would the Bulgarian Secret Service have knocked off the Pope without express permission of the Soviets? Absolutely out of the question. Um, we know that for this reason, that they did in fact knock off a man called, uh, jo I mean, uh, no, <laughs> a man called uh, Georgi Markov in London. I knew his wife slightly. And uh, Markov was killed with a poisoned umbrella. They, 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 they used an umbrella to inject a little ball of poison into his leg. Uh, now, um, the, the, not only did the Bulgarians um, ask permission, but the Soviets lent them the poison, <laughs> and, or rather gave them the poison. And so uh, it's inconceivable that they would ask permission of the Soviets for Georgi Markov, in whom the Soviets had no interest, uh, and not uh, get permission before killing the Pope. And, 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 the, and the, the many people in the KGB themselves will, will tell you they believe they did it. In fact, there used to be apparently a topic of conversation around the water cooler. <laughs> So yes, I think they, I think they, I think they did it, um, and um, the Italian Parliamentary Commission reached the conclusion that this, that, they, that it was beyond reasonable doubt. I would just be slightly shy of that phrase. I, I think it's uh, the, the overwhelming. I think the preponderance of evidence points in the Soviet in a direction, but you can't say absolutely no doubt in that. Gentlemen, uh, where does your book break new ground? Um, in so, a number of places, I would say particularly in uh, the use of some of the Soviet archive material I've got. Um, that that uh, in relates to a number of things. Uh, for example, at one point I have uh, there's some there's marvelously entertaining stuff about Teddy Kennedy in it. Um, <laughs> Kennedy goes to see um, uh, goes to see. Sorry, Kennedy makes an approach to Andropov. Through through a California Senator John uh, Tunney. Tunney. Tunney, that's right, and um, the, the and, 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 and he suggests you know it'd be a good time to this talk this eighty two, and um, and uh, he basically thinks that uh, what's uh, that Reagan's militaristic policy has got to be combated and so on and so forth, and uh, Andropov refuses to see him. <laughs> Andropov says that I think this fellow is you know. Time is gone, really, and, and if we need to talk to the Democrats, let's talk to a, an actual candidate. Um, then, then, um, uh, so it's rather humiliating. Uh, um, then, but then, a few years later, after the Geneva Convention, uh, he goes to see, he goes to Gorbachev. He goes to see Gorbachev, and Gorbachev does see him. But more importantly, um, from the standpoint of evidence, Gorbachev's top aide has dinner with him, and we have the report to Gorbachev from. Uh, Gorbachev's aid about the dinner, and, it, and it's very similar with with with, um, with Kennedy saying, "Look, uh, the Geneva didn't go well at all. You know, Reagan's emerged from Geneva more strongly. Americans think that his policy of strength is paying off. You know, you've got to be tougher." Well, <laughs> well, well, of course. You know, the fact was, 
Kennedy was in the grip of the left-wing delusion that the Soviet Union was still a really powerful country. Gorbachev knew that he was, you know, uh, it was a ramshackle outfit at Berlin keeping on the road. So, but he couldn't say that to Kennedy, obviously. So, you know, he nods and says, you must do what you say. <laughs> um, at least according to, um, uh, I mean, that, that's what Zayn does and reports back. But, but I think this is very, that, that's new stuff. I mean, the, the first meeting is not new. That came out a few years ago, but this, the meeting going by this fact is new. Um, there's a lot of new stuff about the, the way in which uh, the Soviets uh, helped the uh, guerrillas in Nicaragua and El Salvador. They, they got the Ameri they got the Vietnamese to give them weapons, American weapons that they captured in the war. They then flew them to Cuba, um, and then the Cubans uh, sent them by various methods to El Salvador, to the Nicaragua, to the um, Sandinistas, and to um, uh, uh, and to the um, uh, El Salvador guerrillas. So. You know, the arguments that we used to hear, uh, you know, are the communists behind the Nicaraguans and are they behind the El Salvador guerrillas? That's absolutely plain now. And practically the entire uh, Latin American academic profession in this country that just look, look like a damn lot of fools. <laughs> so, but there are other things, but I mean, I think there's, there's a few. This lady at the back. With Putin being elected president, the Soviet Union being the dominant power, what do you see happening with Russia and then we see the Sandinistas and the Nicaragua and Venezuela and everybody coming back together? It seems like it's the ladies part two. It's a very hard question to answer and I'll try my best. I don't see uh, what's happening with Putin, uh, whom I don't like by the way and whom, whose policies I think are very damaging and bad both for everybody else but also for Russia. Um, I don't see him as a communist. I mean he's an old secret agent and he's a thug but fundamentally uh, the people running Russia today are a kleptocratic elite. They're not, they're not, they're not, they don't, they're not people with a mission. They're people who want, got hold of a country, are squeezing it dry, would like to continue to get other, to persuade other people to give them resources, are trying to increase their power in various ways and their power of, 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 of bullying other countries. And they, and, and they are dangerous and they have to be watched and they have to be fought. But I don't think that they are communists in the old sense. And I, the, very quickly, let me give you a thesis here. Um, the, there's a remarkable scholar in Belfast called um, Professor Tucker. And what he has argues is that there's a real distinction between post-authoritarian and post-totalitarian societies. Post-authoritarian societies are societies in which they, all the elites are still in place. You know, if, if you were a Franco or a, a Pinochet, you didn't care who was running the symphony orchestra, uh, you know, or the, uh, the farmers' union. I mean, as long as they didn't interfere in politics, they could get on with their lives. So when the system collapses, when the authoritarian system uh, uh, collapses, the, old, the other elites are still there running the society. A few people go on trial, and after a while, the society picks up and returns to democracy reasonably effectively. There are, there are, there are problems, but it's reasonably... But you know, the history of Spain uh, is very, very good recently. Now, post-totalitarian societies are societies in which the elites have all been destroyed and replaced by a single political elite, which has thought it knew the answer to everything from you know, crop rotation um, to, uh, to, uh, to um, the style of, art, uh, of, of painting. So uh, the result is that you have a society in which the skills of uh, elite skills of uh, management and uh, uh, well, in every field, have atrophied, or people have been afraid to develop them. And as a result, the society is, the only people who know how to run things, are a political elite who don't know how to do anything else. So if they're in charge of industry, well, they know how to use power to get control, but they, they don't know how to run the factory. And um, the result is that they, they become a kind of parasitic elite, which simply tries to get the wealth produced by other people, to increase their power. Now, to that degree, they do bear a certain resemblance to communism, which was also a parasitic uh, elite. But they, but they don't have the same kind of ambitions. Their ambitions are to, to live a, a very comfortable life and to preserve their power indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Just a gentleman here, and then ladies and gentlemen.